Thank you for taking my call. Before we continue, could you say the first and third digits of your security pin? Oh, uh, I didn't catch that. Sorry. That's the second and fourth, please. OK, lovely. I've gone through. <laughs> did you see what I did there? It's a scam. Never reveal your full security pin, even if you think it's your bank calling. Learn how to protect yourself from fraud. Now here on Radio 4, it's time for Any Questions with Chris Mason. Hello again. We are in York on a mooch about earlier on. Plenty of flags. Yes, some Union ones and St George's ones, but the Yorkshire flag too. A white rose on a blue background, definitely the most prominent. We are at the University of York, a tiered audience in front of us in a lecture theatre. And with us, the leader of the Liberal Democrats and former Cabinet Minister Sir Ed Davey, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, the Labour MP Bridget Phillipson, a Yorkshire MP, a Conservative MP, the MP for Morley and Outward, Andrea Jenkins, and a graduate of this university, a journalist, columnist and author, Peter Hitchens. York, your Any Questions panel. <laughs> Martin has our first question. Hi, Martin. Should we turn back migrant boats in the Channel? Peter Hitchens. It's not practical. Uh, it's this, whole, this whole proposal by the Home Secretary is, is it's a dead rat thrown onto the political table to try and distract attention from the government's huge mess over national insurance. It's not a serious proposal, and it even contains the words, uh, only if it is safe to do so, which means, of course, that uh, the people involved will always say it's not safe to do so. Uh, we aren't Australia, we don't have a huge passage of sea between ourselves and our nearest neighbour, nor are we dealing with New Guinea, we're dealing with France. It's very regrettable what's happening, uh, and it's obviously wrong that people should be paying people smugglers huge sums of money to get them to jump the immigration queue. And I, I, However much you may admire the enterprise of people who actually fight their way across the channel to this country, it doesn't mean that they should be allowed to jump the queue because they're prepared to pay criminals to do so and put themselves in hot to criminals for the rest of their lives. But this is not really the answer to the most fundamental question, which is why are these huge flows of people coming across the Mediterranean and indeed uh, through Turkey, through Europe, to this country, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually, uh, and I, I can't help bringing this up because it seems to me it really does need to be said over and over again, it is directly the fault of the Blair government and the Iraq war, which tore the Middle East to pieces the British and American and other governments' interventions in Syria, which have turned millions of people into refugees and th tens of thousands into corpses. Mm -hmm. And, of course, David Cameron's absurd intervention in, in Libya, which has also caused a great deal of this. You cannot overcome it uh, by making populist pl plans for turning people back in the channel. Okay. It's not realistic, and it's stupid, and it shouldn't be taken seriously. It's solely designed to turn the, the, the debate to something else. Given, Peter, looking at the statistics, more than 1,500 migrants across the English Channel by boat this week, what should, therefore, the government do? Well, it's very difficult for them to do anything, I, because if, with, with no co cooperation from France, it, this is the whole problem. You look at this over and over again. What is the civilised thing which you can do to stop it? There may be things that you can do to people who've arrived here illegally, such as uh, some countries have done. So within, in that case, if, if you're going to get benefits, you should work for them. I think some of the Scandinavian countries have done this. Uh, you, you might start saying that if you've arrived here illegally, then your chances of ever getting indefinite right to remain should, uh, should, should be taken away from you. I don't know exactly what you can do. What you certainly cannot do uh, is, is push boats backwards in the channel, which you then might sink, or hand them over to the French, who will then send them back. That, that is neither, uh, it's neither safe nor practical, nor politically realistic. Okay. And that, I'm afraid that that is the difficulty. We have this huge flow of people coming across Europe now. Many of them want to come here. Mm -hmm. And we cannot stop them by any humane means. So we're going to have to work out some way of coping with the fact that people are arriving here illegally. I do very much think that those who come here legally through the proper methods uh, should be those who get the preferential treatment. OK. Uh, Bridget Phillipson for Labour. I think it's both dangerous, uh, lacking humanity, but also just isn't 
going to work. I think it is just appalling that the Home Secretary is even considering putting public servants in a position that might actually jeopardise people's lives, because that's what we've heard in terms of what would happen if these kinds of measures were to be taken. It does jeopardise people's lives on those boats. Now, of course, you know, we want to see action against criminal gangs that exploit people. But as we've seen in recent weeks and months with Afghanistan, there are desperate people facing persecution, many of whom we owe a debt because of the work they did with us, supporting our troops, supporting Br the British government in the action that we were taking in Afghanistan. And those desperate people, and many of them are incredibly desperate, um, should be supported to have safe and legal routes to seek sanctuary in our country. I do not think the approach the Home Secretary is recommending is consistent with our values as a nation. I don't think it's the kind of country we are, and I do not think it's the kind of country that we should be. Sir so, uh, David, next. No, I completely disagree with the Home Secretary. But we must stop the crossings because How? they're dangerous and people are dying and we need to find other ways. And the fact that they're increasing in number is a failure of Priti Patel, the Home Secretary. How do we do it? We have to offer safe and legal routes for genuine refugees to come to our country. We're doing that with some of the Afghan refugees, the resettlement programmes. They could be extended. We should have extended them more in the case of Syria. There are programmes like family reunion programmes, which the Conservative government have turned their back on. There are ways, humane ways, which are completely in line with British values, where we offer sanctuary, as we've done for so many centuries. I have a real problem with the Conservatives' overall approach to refugees. The Conservatives say they're the party of the family and the party of hard work, except when it comes to refugees. They deliberately separate families by not allowing family reunion. How dreadful. And they stop asylum seekers being able to work when they come to this country. There's a ban on asylum seekers working. I think it's horrific, and I think it's got to stop. And Priti Patel has got to change her ways. She's a very bad Home Secretary. To Andrea Jenkins in a second, but just a specific, uh, Ed, on the, the, the challenge as far as those crossing the channel are concerned. I take the point, you, the broader point you make about other legal routes, but given that there are still so many people trying to cross in boats, what should the government do about those in boats this weekend, for instance? That they're on the water, they're on some sort of craft, they're heading to the UK. What should the government do? Well, what all sensible governments do when you're faced with international waters is you have international cooperation. And Priti Patel has essentially picked an argument with the French. You can ask her why she's done that. She should be working with the French. She should be cooperating with the French. She should be finding ways to go through it. But this is a government that doesn't like to cooperate internationally. The government's been talking to the French government, hasn't it? Well, uh, I think you can see from the reaction of the French government to this, attitude, to, to this particular uh, proposal that she has not been very successful in her diplomacy. And whether it's her fault, Dominic Raab's fault, or let's be clear, the Prime Minister's fault, mm -hmm. I think this government's got it completely wrong. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you. Well, I'm probably the only one in this room. Um, look at the honest, I agree with our Home Secretary, Priti Patel. I mean, what do we do? Do we put a big neon sign saying, um, you know, everybody welcome? That will just encourage people to do more dangerous crossings. Of course we don't. This is the right rhetoric, actually. And um, we must encourage, um, sorry, discourage um, illegal and safe crossing. And regarding Ed's point about France, look, we've given £54 million of British taxpayers' money. Um, it's got conditions on it um, to France. Um, we, re we expect them to double their numbers of police officers to patrol the coast. And if they're not living up to their um, side of the bargain, then we need to hold them to account. This is British taxpayers' money. And we, we know that um, the... The border force, they have got to go in line with international um, law and maritime law, and um, they've got to make sure it's deemed safe um, to do so. But I, I think it's wholeheartedly, it's right to have that rhetoric out there. We don't want people to do this unsafe 
crossings. And quite frankly, let, let's also remember, you know, we, we're talking here, um, as um, Bridget said, it's not just refugees. We've done amazing um, with Afghanistan and bringing refugees over and the measures that we've put in place. We're talking about a lot of economic migrants coming over um, via this means. And so we need to not do true. everything possible to discourage this crossing um, because it's a dangerous crossing. So, Ed, briefly. The Home Office have shown that uh, about 98% of those people who come over on small boats uh, apply for asylum and the vast majority gain it. So let's, not, uh, let's get some facts into this. And I have to say, uh, uh, for the Conservatives here, um, the fact that they have opposed uh, Liberal Democrat and other opposition parties' mm -hmm. plans to improve laws, to enable family reunion, is a disgrace. Okay. And they've got to change that. Peter had his hand up. Well, I'm very joking, so it's the right rhetoric, which I think is a giveaway, really, because it is rhetoric. It, it will not stop anybody from arriving. It's very typical of the Conservative Party, which has for many, many years posed as a party which wanted to restrict immigration to, to please its voters and supporters, but has never actually succeeded in doing so at any stage. It's, it, is, it is purely posturing, and it's, it's interesting that it's made very shortly before the weather changes, after which for many months it will be very difficult for okay. people uh, to cross the channel in any case. The political question remains, these huge flows of population heading towards Western Europe have been caused by disastrous decisions, widely publicly supported, I should say, that to create wars, particularly in the Middle East and mm -hmm. North Africa, which we are now paying a very heavy price for. The okay. next time anybody comes up and suggests one of these wars, will you please fight much harder against them getting away with it? Bridget. I think rather than picking a fight with the French authorities or picking a fight with the RNLI or whoever else the Home Secretary wants to pick a fight with on any kind of given day of the week, Let's try and see some effective measures to work with the French, so not just um, at the Channel, but inland as well. You know, I think, you know, re talking about this kind of rhetoric all the time mm -hmm. doesn't get us anywhere. And I think we hear a lot about how, you know, our country uh, isn't, you know, shouldn't be welcoming people who are fleeing persecution. I mean, just over the summer, you know, I visited a project in Sunderland that works to support refugees, asylum seekers who've come to our country what you will hear from those people about the persecution that they have faced and the situation that they have left, families left behind, the last thing that they wanted to do was to leave their home where they had, where they wanted a future, the last thing that they wanted. But what they're seeing at the moment are very, very long waits to even hear, have their case heard. Mm -hmm. The Home Office should be doing a lot more to process cases more quickly, to make sure that people okay. can have their interview and get on with their lives. Because, you know, holding people in that kind of limbo is just completely wrong as well. Thank you. Yeah. If you want to join the uh, conversation on Saturday afternoon on any answers, here is the number. Uh, 03700 100 444. 03700 100 444. You can call from half 12. Anita is on the radio as usual at two. Our second question from Roderick. Hello, Roderick. Hello. Um, how long do panel members believe that the recent interruptions to supplies of various goods and services will continue? Bridget Phillipson for Labour. Uh, well, sadly, as we've heard from the Food and Drink Federation, those... Um, those kind of blockages and delays are likely to continue for the foreseeable future, which is why it's, unless the action is taken by the government, which is why it's essential that we see action to uh, sort out the disruption in the supply chain. So, you know, we've heard, for example, that the government are suggesting that HGV drivers could work longer hours. I mean, what I think matters most is for the government to work with businesses, to work with trade unions, to get good terms and conditions for people, to get more people into the industry. We face that real shortage there. Now, of course, uh, COVID and Brexit has had an impact, but this problem has been coming down the line for the last 10 years. You know, we know we face... Um, an ageing workforce in the HGV sector, and we ha the government just has not done enough to get people in. Now, as we approach Christmas, I think the last thing people want to see are further delays and disruption um, you know, in terms of goods coming into the country. It is having a big, wider knock-on effect mm -hmm. on the economy as well. You know, we've seen today that you know, growth within the economy is very, very weak. Um, we're still at a really fragile point for our economic recovery. I think that's also why it's completely wrong that in addition to facing these kinds of problems, we're also seeing a lot being brought forward by the government that's going to hit families at a really tough time as well, whether that's universal credit, 
the national insurance rise that working people are going to see, increases in council tax, prices okay. are going up, uh, and that's going to be really hard for people to manage. Focusing on the specifics of these logistical challenges and lack of wagon drivers, for instance, how, how much do you blame Brexit? I think clearly it is a factor, uh, absolutely. But I think you do have to look at the wider problems within the sector that we've seen, as I say, coming for the last decade. We were already facing uh, an ageing workforce and the government's done nothing to sort that out. It work, you know, working conditions can often be pretty poor for a lot of HGV drivers and that has to improve. But again, I just want the government to work constructively with people to try and find a way through this, not just kind of casting about blame, which is what it seems to come down to all the time. So let's see that we can get more Who's people the into the blaming? industry. Who's the government blaming? Well, we've seen, well, there's the suggestion that, you know, people have returned home, there's delays around COVID, you know, I think that's part of it. But we face this shortage now for some years. Mm -hmm. It's been obvious the problems are going to get worse. As I say, I think Brexit and COVID have exacerbated long-standing problems that are there. I think we need to broaden the people coming into the industry. So opening it up to, to more women, for example, making a more attractive career, improving wages, improving working conditions. I think it's a lot that the government could do working with business and trade unions to mm -hmm. make that happen. Andrea Jenkins. Um, Chris Roderick. I'm a trucker's daughter. Um, I, my Dad was a trucker up and down the country growing up. I, I, I'd go away with him at times. And I have to say that I, I visited um, a local transport firm in my constituency a few weeks ago. The trucks are far better nowadays than it ever was when I went out with my dad. And I want to actually start by, because I think they are the unsung heroes, especially during Brexit. You know, they're the ones, the drivers up and down the country who kept our economy going and food on the table. So I think we need to actually take our hat off to them. <laughs> What's gone wrong, which means there aren't as yeah. many as, as we need? Well, the, I mean, there's several factors here. Um, we know some has gone back to the EU, but there's also COVID. I mean, um, I mean, regarding the Brexit thing, which I know a lot of Remainers have, have been, you know, emailing me saying it's down to Brexit. But if that was the case, look at France, Germany and Spain. They're having the same issues of driver shortages. But... During COVID, um, especially, um, I mean, it's, I think, first of all, it's a cost of getting a license. It's a, a massive cost attached to it, and you've got to pay that as an individual, so that can put people off. It's quite a decent salary now, um, you know, speaking to the different transport industries, what they pay the drivers. Um, but it, with, during COVID, the DVLA, on average, you know, they'd be um, processing LGV, HGV um, licenses about 1150 a week which um, is nowhere near enough, and especially mm. with the backlog we had with COVID. But I know the government's invested in that now. Uh, as a trucker's daughter, I've got an interest in it. Um, and they're processing over 15,000 a week now. So that's, that's one aspect. And, but I think it's um, actually making, like Bridget said, it's making the industry um, more of an interesting career for all, sec all people from society. And the stuff that we're doing, I mean, we're doing this apprenticeship scheme, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. um, which was There's 100,000 drivers, a shortage of 100,000 mm -hmm. drivers, according to the World College Association. We're seeing so many sectors, aren't we, saying yes. that they have shortages. The Christmas rush, not a million yeah. miles away. Uh, can you say anything to, to reassure our listener that that kind of gap, 100,000 drivers short, is going to be plugged any time soon? Well, I mean, it's the same with, with any type of industry, whether it's, um, you know, the NHS training doctors up and nurses up. Um, it, it, it does take time. However, the government have been working closely with, you know, the industry because it is private sector led. We're working closely with the industry. They're doing their part. Um, and by, as I said, by putting these apprenticeship schemes in place, we've been rolling back EU legislation, for example, you know, you needed a separate test to drive a car with a trailer, we, you know, the little things like this. Maybe we're that's a good idea. Yes, we, we, that's what we're doing. We're, we're relaxing the hours, um, but um, where drivers can now... No, hang on, sorry, what are you relaxing about driving with a trailer? That you, um, that it's it, not you used to need a separate test, didn't you, to be able to drive a car with a trailer. We're relaxing um, that with in EU legislation. Reassure our listener who is following a car with a trailer that that's a good idea <laughs> no it's not a joke is it no. i mean it's serious i mean i, I, I get i get that there's a, a trade-off between how much you regulate yes. and the extent to which it unblocks this shortage but there's there's a trade-off there isn't there and there's a safety question I mean, you'll always find a uh, safety um, question in anything but i think that the let's face it the i think there's more robust um actually driving um, tests now than ever before 
Um, okay. I don't know if, if I would have passed it even after my fifth time of trying um, when, um, when I was um, passing my test. Uh, but but I, I know they're working very closely with industry um, mm-hmm. and the food and drink industry as well. And I do believe we'll see a massive improvement. Yes, there will be that um, time lapse while new drivers get trained up. OK. So, Ed David, next. Well, I think this is a crisis. Crisis and shortage of lorry drivers. But if you talk to people in the hotel and cafe restaurants, they haven't got the staff for the hospitality sector. We're seeing building materials, the prices of wood and cement going through the roof. We're seeing not enough workers for chicken processing factories. We're seeing food shelves uh, that don't have any food on them. We're seeing shortages of beer in some places. I think in any other world, this would be seen as a bit of a failure by the government. I think a huge failure. And I think we could be looking, as we look to Christmas... Uh, at a chaotic Christmas. And I think the government just aren't taking this properly and seriously enough. So what would you do now? You've been in government. If you were in government now, what would you do? Well, first of all, I'd listen to business. And what business is saying is they want the government to have some visas for lorry drivers as one of the things they're they're wanting. They're wanting business... uh, They're wanting... uh, Business wanting government to take a whole range of different actions. But this government is sort of... Deaf to business. And it's really interesting, isn't it? The Conservatives used to be the party of business. They used to listen to business. But they're not interested anymore in what I would call common sense approach. Well, what's the evidence that they're not listening to business? Well, if you talk to the CBI, the CBI is saying that they're looking at a two-year shortage of labour unless the government acts. We heard from Ian Wright, the chief executive of the Food and Drink Federation, who's saying that because of Brexit, uh, we're looking at permanent changes. Now, you know, what has caused this? Clearly, COVID has uh, had an impact. Andrew is quite right on that. Uh, I think um, Bridget's right. There have been some long-term uh, issues as well. There have been problems in DVLA, DVLA licensing. But if people think that Brexit has nothing to do with this, I think they're living in cloud cuckoo land. There is a huge problem in our economy, and it was caused by Boris Johnson and the Conservatives. Um, can I come in here, Chris? Andrea. Thank you. Um, first of all, the, the organisations you mentioned, like the CBI, was completely against Brexit in the first place and had the f- same fatalistic attitude like you've got. I, I, I've got more faith, actually, um, in the private sector um, and in the government. If we can get through a pandemic and still get deliveries... Um, but the point is we can't. Uh, no, I'm just moment. saying when everybody was ordering online then, let's face it, people w- couldn't get to the supermarket, then we will get through a, a, a busy Christmas period. Are you sure? Yes. So, so, so what I'm trying to understand is, if we were able to, to get through these problems during COVID, what's happened now? Why are the problems occurring now? Is it because the economy is opening up and the problems that were caused by your government are now really evident? I think that's uh, the truth. And I think unless you listen to business and the Conservatives listen to the business, mm-hmm. we're going to have a real problem in our country and Christmas is going to be miserable. But we are listening to businesses. <laughs> you know, our, you're, you're our, not doing um, what our government's in conversations you know, on a daily basis with the industry and they're working closely with the private sector okay. to ensure that we have a good Christmas. Pe- I have more faith. Peter Hitchens. Thank you. In, in answer to Roderick's question, I think we're going to have to get used to this. I feel a strange sense of nostalgia for the days when I lived in the Soviet Union. <laughs> 30 years ago, under a stupid, stupid, dogmatic authoritarian government which couldn't get anything right. And here we have it again. I, whatever view you may take of this lot, lot before, we've been working at this for years, and now we're finally getting empty shelves in the shops. It's so David's shoulders I feel are such shaking a sense with of, laughter. Of the familiarity. But I, I, I would also buy in a small, um, a small I told you so point here about the, the, there is a Brexit element in this beyond doubt. And those of us who said, for goodness sake, go for the Norway option, stay in the, uh, in, stay in the European economic area, have been proven again and again to be right over this. If we'd done that, most of these things would never come. But I must here refer to what everybody knows is the Trucker's newspaper, the Financial Times, <laughs> uh, which can say the fascinating series of details about this, which, which, which should go on record here. This is the ONS figures. 40,000 of the 300,000 truck drivers in the UK were from the EU. This dropped to, to, by, by half, but it's now back up to, to 25,000. But huge numbers of, of truck drivers are leaving because they, they've been off, isolating or otherwise, during COVID. These are domestic ones, and they're not coming back. As 50,000 UK-based drivers have left the profession since the pandemic began, mainly those over 45, okay. because they don't want to go back. Many of you will know 
people who have decided after this interval they don't want to go back to work and they're not doing it. And this is one of the many disasters caused by what's going on with my final word. And this is mm-hmm. stop worrying about, about roads and lorries. Build some railways and start transporting stuff around by train. We don't have any trains. <laughs> Renationalize them, rebuild them, stop worrying about that. And this is why horrible, we're investing. Horrible, nasty, dangerous yeah. things that they are in. Anyway. This is why we're investing in apprenticeship schemes, etc., for drivers. Because you know, what's the, there's nothing better than actually training up um, people in our own country to mm-hmm. do these roles. Okay, uh, back to Roderick. Our question, uh, Roderick. How do you answer your own question? I'm interested in the fact that most of the focus has been on lorry drivers, and I'd like to pick up a point that uh, Bridget made initially about having more female drivers in there. So instead of having the land girls like we had in the last war, we could have lorry ladies uh, to take over <laughs> or meet some of the uh, deficiencies in demand. But overall, um, I think uh, there should be more attention paid to things like the trade agreement with the European Union. Uh, that has probably contributed to it. And all the factors to do with um, workforce issues. Okay. Because it also extends to things like social care and other services. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate it. 03700 100 444 if you'd like to talk about the whole business of wagon drivers, train drivers, logistics, Brexit, COVID, all of the issues we've discussed in the last couple of minutes. 03700 100 444. Sheila has our next question. Hello, Sheila. Hello. I used to know what our different political parties stood for, but now I don't. Could the panel help me? with a one-sentence definition of what each of our parliamentary parties fundamentally believe. Strictly one sentence. Sheila, I must admit, when I saw your question earlier on, I thought, this is a good one. I think they're all good, but I thought this one is a good one. And the key word for me is strictly one sentence. So I'll ask each of you for your own political party, or for Peter, your own world view, to see if you can do... Uh, your your political philosophy, if you like, or your party's political philosophy, in a sentence, preferably without too many commas. Um, <laughs> starting with a capital letter, letter, ending in a full stop. Sir Ed Davey. We want to empower people so that they can take charge of their lives, whether it's in education, health or care, so people feel freer in their lives and have got more control. And we want to hold the Sorry. powerful to account, whether they're fossil fuel companies or the City of London or this Conservative government. Bridget Phillipson. Whoever you are, wherever, you fr- wherever you're from, whichever family that you're born into, you have every chance and every opportunity so- to succeed in life with a government that makes that happen. Andrea Jenkins. We are the Democrats who believe in democracy and we believe in investing in our children's future. Peter Hitchens. Well, the Conservative Party is an organisation for obtaining office at any cost for the sons of gentlemen. Uh, the, the Labour Party is an organisation for promoting the interests of the population of the London Borough of Islington. And what the Liberal Democratic Party is, I simply cannot I've just, tell I've just, you. I've just told you. <laughs> any others? SNP, perhaps? Well, I think it's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> Thought I'd give you the option well, to complete you, the Well, thank you, but I know. Let's not waste time. And, and, a, and a quick sentence on your political philosophy, Peter, because you've been on quite a political journey in your time. Yes, I, I, I used to be, when I was here at the university, I was a Trotskyist, but I'm not... Someone told me a tale that you once said as an excuse for being late to a lecture oh, that you no, were this Greg fermenting Dyke, revolution. Greg Dyke making up a story about, about seminars we didn't both go to. No, I, it, I, it, the, I came to the conclusion several years ago that actually British politics was very funny, uh, that it has no purpose, uh, that it is, it, apart from being show business for, um, how should I put it, not... Um, totally attractive people. It doesn't have... You know how to flatter your fellow panels. It doesn't have... There is no politics in it anymore. They don't believe in anything. Uh, they, there is a profession... But, I mean, do you there, is a, there is a profession of politics. People go, come out of university, they become special advisors. Uh, they then rise very quickly into, into becoming members of parliament and, and ministers. They know very little and they care very little. And it is, as I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ambitious profession which doesn't have any, uh, any, any uh, deep political principles at all, as I think we've, seen, minute, though, I I think mean, we've seen demonstrated beautifully this week isn't that by a sort of party which stands, stands for election or, as, a, as a Conservative party and does what, 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 what this party is. Isn't that a deeply cynical view? And we've had the best part of half an hour conversation with a passionate exchange of views, people's passionate arguments about the range of topics we've done, and, and you're suggesting there's a kind of fakery to that? I am suggesting there's a kind of fakery to it, yes, absolutely. 
Oh, uh, three seven hundred. Like you as well, <laughs> Chris. Chris, uh, can I say I think that's a huge disservice to lots of politicians from all political parties who work extremely hard for their constituents and try to put their country's best. And I, I would say to you, Peter, there are some tabloid journalists who like to be contro- controversial so they can pick up a nice cheque at the end of the week. I wasn't, I, wasn't asse- I wasn't assessing you, Sir Ed, on your qualities as a social worker, uh, which I've no doubt are extremely good. I was assessing you in your qualities as somebody who wants to, to lead and direct a, a, a okay. major and important country, which is a wholly different activity. OK. I think we've broken Sheila's maximum of one sentence. So at that point, we'll move on to Amanda next. Hello, Amanda. Hello. Is it fair to young people already saddled with student debt to fund social care through the rise in national insurance proposed. Thank you, Amanda. Andrea Jenkins, Conservative MP, on this first. Thank you, Chris. Um, I mean, look, I'm a Conservative. I don't believe in tax rises. Um, but you voted and, for it. Well, um, yes, and I'm, I'll explain why. Um, and, you know, I'm, I believe in free markets. I believe in freedom. And... But when you actually look um, at the figures, you know, we're talking five million people uh, waiting to have an operation at the moment. And they're saying it could get up to 13 million um, in just three months um, by the end of the year. Um, That's one in five people. That's one in virtually every family across the UK. It could be stuff like hip operations, uh, um, for example. And before the pandemic, you know, nine out of ten people was waiting something like 26 weeks uh, Mm -hmm. for an operation. It's gone up to 44 now. Um, the pandemic has changed things, unfortunately. And um, we, we need to raise money quickly. to Because um, imagine if we didn't do anything. If we're talking 13 million people waiting for an operation by the end of the year, if mm-hmm. we didn't do anything, what, what would happen? Now, um, it's not the first time a party has, has raised national insurance. Um, in 2003, Labour did it by 1% to in, invest into the NHS. Didn't they promise before the election before that no, that but, they wouldn't do it, though? Yes, but the, but, um, the difference is, you know, pandemic. <laughs> a global pandemic. Um, and, um, and let's face it, I don't believe any um, successive government has fully tackled this, um, this um, social care crisis, mm-hmm. including the one that Ed was part of as a secretary of state under the coalition, none oh. have. Okay. So it's, I think it's very brave of the government to tackle this. Mm-hmm. It's not exactly the most popular way of doing it. However, it's tough decisions got to make. And, and, let's and on at, the let's specific, sorry to interrupt, on the specific of Amanda's question, because yes. she's making a point about intergenerational fairness. Yes. Is it fair to young people to fund social care through a rise in national insurance? When you see that if you're earning £20,000, you're going to be paying an extra £130 a year in tax, £30,000 extra £255 I mean, pounds I, a year in tax. Is this fair on the young earners in their first job, potentially, paying that amount of extra tax from a party that spent its lifetime talking about being low tax. Yes. Um, I mean, let's face it, young people are going to be old one day and potentially need um, social care themselves. We're seeing that Alzheimer's, dementia, I have cafes, dementia cafes that I set up and run in my own constituency. You know, we're seeing a massive rise in that. And But the top 14% of um, earners will be paying 50% of, of the funds needed. And let's look at what this looks like in figures. You know, the average salary UK, what is it, about 24,000? That works out about £3.40-odd P a week um, extra to pay on national insurance. We've already invested £12 billion. Um, but, I mean, on your point um, specifically about students, I mean, I went um, to university as a mature student um, while fighting the seat. I studied... Um, I studied international relations at Lincoln um, at the same time as doing economics through the Open Uni at the same time as being a parliamentary candidate. And um, those eight hours a week um, face-to-face time as a mature student Mm -hmm. didn't seem enough for me as a mature student who hadn't studied for 20-odd years. So what what pupils have been through on the pandemic and feeling, do they feel that they've gone value for money? Um, You know, they're paying um, massive um, amounts of money. Meandering a little Um, off the topic. No, I'm just saying that. So back to that, you know, um, students... Students would find it um, a very difficult pill to swallow, but as I said, they're going to get um, older one day, mm-hmm. and um, it's you know the more you earn, the more you pay, okay. and I think it should be all hands on deck to, to tackle this crisis. Thank you, uh, Bridget Phillipson, Shadow Chief Secretary of the Treasury, therefore in charge of the numbers for Labour and, and big decisions for a government to take for an opposition to consider around a rise in national insurance to fund social care. Something successive governments have 
avoided doing anything about. How do you take on Amanda's question? It isn't fair and it won't work. So I don't think it's right to, to expect the burden to fall on working people and onto businesses actually who are going to really struggle uh, in the months ahead. Who's going to pay but, for it then, Bridget? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll happily come on to that, uh, Andrea. But at the same time, there isn't a plan backing all of this up. There is no plan for the NHS, how we clear those backlogs. You know, Andrea, you said that there were 5 million people on the waiting list. They were there already. That was before the pandemic. It's completely wrong to suggest that these problems have just appeared during the pandemic. So we believe... It hasn't increased during the pandemic, is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is the NHS has had a decade now of neglect from your government, which meant that going into the pandemic, it was already weakened. But running alongside this tax rise, which is going to really hurt working people and really hurt businesses as well, there is no plan for how this is going to lead to any improvement in social care. But, but your also shadow how, can I just, secretary can I, Andrea, can I, said you backed yeah. rises previously um, in tax okay. to pay for the NHS. So what we, what we believe quite clearly is that those with the broader shoulders should make more of a contribution. Of course this has to be paid for, we all recognise this, but your government, time and time again, first comes to working people. Universal okay, credit, so, so where, national insurance, you... council tax, the pressures that people are facing. And take, for example, the constituent that I met today, who's an unpaid carer for her mother who has dementia. Will what is being set out do anything to improve the working conditions of carers? Mm -hmm. Will it do anything to improve the quality of care? No, it won't, and we will not support How it. How would Labour pay for this? Of course, the funding of public services, and that includes social care, should be borne across the taxation system, and it should be done in a fair way. How? Why we oppose this? Well, there are a range of ways in which you could do it. You can look, for example, to a whole range of income measures, but it Sounds shouldn't like you don't always... Know. No, it, it, for example, what the measure does around national insurance doesn't ask anything of That's critiquing those who the government, have... which obviously is part of your job, but what's the Labour plan? Where would you tax to generate this kind of money? So you could look... There, well, there are a range of different options within the tax system. Income tax, wealth you, tax. You can look at measures that are fair across the generations and across income. This measure what could meets that look like neither test. Well, there are, I mean, for the example... about this one, um, if you think of the briefly. devolved powers um, of, of you know, um, Wales, um, Scotland, Northern Ireland, etc., you've got to consider that as well. Now, this okay. makes sure that um, that's considered. You haven't actually said one thing that you would do. Could, what could, you okay. would could, could I just could Peter. I possibly make a point? I mean, Peter. Those of us who have lived through Labour chancellors and Tory chancellors in, time, in hard times know that under these circumstances they behave almost identically. Uh, the Labour Party has very little to say about this because they would have done, obviously not an identical thing, but something very similar if they were in the same position. What is this position? Uh, I, the, the first point to make is the, the delusion that the fact that you pay more tax will mean that you get better services or that the things which are, uh, are promised to you will happen mm -hmm. is a very serious delusion. First of all, there's no guarantee that, that any of this money will ever actually reach social care. Uh, if it's d diverted initially to the National Health Service, it will be very difficult to get out of it again because the National Health Service is an enormous pit. So that, okay. you know, that might well not happen. The point really here is that we are, we are having the first wave of the enormous payment for the, for the panic uh, into which our government went over COVID. Uh, the first payment of many because they spent far more money than they had. They pretended for 18 months that there was a magic money tree, something okay. which they'd mocked Jeremy Corbyn for saying there was. They pretended there was. They spent limitlessly. And now we are going to have to pay it back in higher taxes. And I absolutely guarantee you also in quite heavy inflation and, okay. many, and in reduced services. And oh, this is the beginning of it. And who, whichever of these people was in power, this is what you will get. You're paying the bill for a, for, for a, for a, for a you, major Peter. piece of spendthrift folly. I want to get to another question in a second before we run out of time, but Sir Ed Davey next, Lib Dem leader, uh, but also a carer, a carer for your son and you were for your mum, was it, as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that for May, but to answer the question first of all, yeah. um, this isn't a fair way of funding social care. The burden will fall unfairly on younger people. And why is that particularly unfair in this case? The biggest beneficiary of the cap on care costs will be older people and the wealthiest people, the people with the highest value properties. And although they're going to be the beneficiaries, we're asking young and middle-aged workers 
to pay the biggest share of the bills. That is wrong. And it, it is even worse than that because it won't fix care. You know, you're right. I've been a carer most of my life. I was a carer for my mother when she was dying, when I was a teenager. And I looked after my uh, wonderful nana when she was frail and elderly. And I've got a, a lovely 13-year-old um, civilly disabled son who my wife and I care for. So I've done a lot of caring in my life. And I, there are millions of people out there like me who care for their family members. It's a big part of their lives too. And I've been wanting a social care package. I've been wanting our country to benefit from because those millions of unpaid carers um, aren't getting the support they need. And you know what? This care package contains nothing for them. Worse still, for the uh, paid carers who are looking after our elderly people in the care homes, our mm -hmm. disabled people in the care homes, it's not dealing with the sh huge shortage, 120,000 vacancies in care staff, nothing for them in this package. I think it's really sad, it's unfair, and it's not going to fix care. Oh. Oh, 03700 if you'd like to talk about care on uh, any answers. Uh, our final question uh, this week from Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Hello. The events of the f past few months, combined with the IPCC report, paint a bleak picture for the environment. Is the UK doing enough to tackle the climate crisis? We just heard from Sered on the previous question, but you are a former climate change secretary, so take this one on first, if you, if you may. We're not doing anywhere near enough. Uh, when I was a cabinet minister, the Liberal Democrats, we nearly quadrupled renewable power, made us the world leader in offshore wind, and the Tories have squandered uh, that uh, achievement. But we need to do even more than just do well in our own country. We're only 2% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We need to use our power internationally. And guess what? We've got that in the City of London. In the City of London, uh, a lot of money for the fossil fuel industry around the world, oil, gas and coal, is raised. I think over 15% of money raised for coal exploitation around the world is raised in London. We need to change the rules and regulations on the City of London so we turn off that tap. We have that power, not just to do more in our own country with renewables and energy efficiency and so on, but through the City of London we can have a massive impact across the world and we need to see that sort of leadership and we're just not getting it from Boris Johnson. Thank you. A request for relatively short answers as we head towards the brick wall of the end of the programme. Bridget Phillipson for Labour, next. Uh, no, we're not doing nearly enough as a country and we've got to do a lot more. We should be bringing forward capital investment to create those new jobs that we desperately need to see. I mean, not just because it's the right thing to do in, in tackling climate change, but also we know we face kind of big challenges within the economy as well. We've led the world so often, and on this we should be leading the world too. You know, in my city in Sunderland, we've developed so much of the tremendous technology around electric cars. Um, this is a real opportunity to create good, well-paid, highly skilled jobs. And in fact, in recent years, we've seen a reduction in the number of jobs in these kinds of areas. We should harness the tremendous potential that we have as a country, tackle climate change, lead the world, but also create jobs in parts of the country where we desperately need to see more. Peter Hitchens, do, do politicians need to be honest about what people might have to give up if these various climate targets are to be met? Well, I wish they would do, because our policy is based on the most ludicrous posturing. And earlier on this week, on Monday, not far down the road from here at the West Burton power station, we switched on a coal-fired power station because there wasn't enough wind and because gas had become so incredibly expensive, we couldn't afford to br bring it in to run gas power stations. That's the state of our, uh, our power generation system, which we, have, in which we have eliminated almost all coal-fired burning stations at the same time as China, which already has 1,000 gigawatts of coal-fired power, is building 259 gigawatts of coal-fired power. We never had anything remotely resembling that. Our entire power system is about 85 gigawatts, and one power station is about 1.5. Our contribution to, to the – let's set, set aside any argument about whether the arguments are correct. Our mm -hmm. contribution uh, to reducing carbon – uh, through this is, is incredibly tiny and totally cancelled So what out. should we do? Totally cancelled out. Should we just well, say to well, hell and carry on as well? That's another argument. You wanted me to be brief. I don't think there's a possibility of being brief about, about man-made global warming. What I'm saying is on its own terms, the British government's policy is self-destructive. Not merely do we shut down these coal-fired power stations. When we shut them down, we immediately demolish them. 
So there's no possibility, mm -hmm. if we need them back, of bringing them back right. into action, but as happened we... earlier on this week. If, if what happened on Monday to our power system, which is lacking in both power and inertia, which is a vital part of power generation, mm -hmm. if what happened on Monday happens again next year, West Burton will be shut. And almost certainly within a few months of being shut, it will be blown up, and we won't be able to do that, making us either victims of power cuts okay. or dependent upon imported electricity from people who may not want to supply it to us. What, what should we do now, though, as a, as a country? Should we say, you know, to, to hell with all of these targets and get rid of them and carry on as we used to, or, or what? Well, we should stop this dogmatic self-destruction which we're engaged in, for certain. If, 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 anybody want, if anybody's seriously concerned about, about these things and believes the, 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 the views of, of, of Greta Thunberg and the and Extinction Rebellion, then the country which they should be turning to is China. And China has publicly said this week it's not interested in being told what to do. And it will not be told what to do. China will pursue its own coal-fired policies, and it will burn as much coal as it wants to, whatever we do. And if mm -hmm. we can't change that, then almost everything that is said here tonight is nothing more than empty posturing. Andrea Jenkins, you were uh, nodding your head then on the point about China. Most definitely. Um, I mean, the climate change activists, if they want to vent their anger and frustration to, towards somebody, be China. Um, I mean, I, I think we're doing amazing as a, a country. You know, we were the first um, to set world leading targets, the first economy to set a net zero <laughs> <laughs> target. Um, and... Um, and we've shown we're investing in green jobs. So, you know, to people saying that we're not, um, I'd say that's poppycock. And what to, Peter, be, what to Peter's point? That maybe there's, to what to Peter's the point? Then maybe of, there's no point. China. Sorry? What, to, what to Peter's point? That maybe there's no point given what's happening in China. You agree with him on that point. So, what about the argument that might then say, is all this stuff worth doing? Well, I think, I think um, you know, it, it's always if, if, you know, as a government, as a party, whichever political party, you've got a strong belief in, in something and, and, you know, so-called saving the planet, etc. then... So-called saving the planet. Um, but, you, you should invest in but, it. But, Andrew, who's going to provide the power for all these electric cars you want everybody to have? Where's it going to come from? And, and You're talking to somebody who's got a diesel nobody car. Nobody has Peter. a clue. Yeah. These things are constantly projected. We're going to have zero okay. this and zero. So, Ed Davey, in, in our remaining... First of all, work. First of all, let's be clear. Peter's wrong on this uh, point about coal. We could have easily had gas power stations online. They were there. Uh, the system chose not to put them on. So we had plenty of power. I Just, said that. I, I said that. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're confirming that. No, I said but on that. China, on that. China, so you're, people, you're right. People are right that China needs to take action. But China has been moving far faster than people think okay. in wind and solar. And what we need to do is really work with them in Glasgow, okay. COP26. Thank you. Is Johnson doing that? Which we're hosting no, he here, isn't. which is, shows you, you know, what we're doing. Okay. You're, Thank you very much, all. From here at the University of York. Thank you for listening.